Cool. All right. So we are recording. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar slash in-person presentation on the building stretch code updates and how they relate to the town of Maynard. My name is Julie, and I am a sustainability coordinator for a local community. I'm going to just work on the how do I change slides here. I don't know. There we go. Okay. All right. So I'm going to give you a little just quick background about me so you know who who you're hearing from and, and why I'm here. Uh, my background is I'm a civil environmental engineer. Uh, I spent a number of years uh, in municipal engineering consulting, meaning I um, did a lot of municipal master planning. I designed wastewater systems and uh, sewer, sewer design and um, did a lot of watershed impact, um, comprehensive planning, that kind of thing. Um, I also have experience in Maynard. Um, I was president of the Maynard Business Alliance for a couple of years and did some work um, during that time with the Economic Development Committee. Um, and now I'm sustainability coordinator for a local municipality. Everything that I give you in this presentation today is stuff that I'm talking about with the municipality that I work with as well. Um, and really, you know, there's a, a bigger conversation kind of happening within different municipalities, kind of wrapping our heads around the stretch code. So I'm going to give you some context and um, just know, like in general, this really is an overview. It's not meant to be comprehensive. You're not going to get every detail. Um, I really want to provide you with kind of like contextual information because a lot of kind of the, the details of the plan, I and mean, you can look at the numbers and the charts, um, but without having that, you know, like more digested contextual understanding of kind of like the bigger picture, it's hard to understand like where things are going and why we're even having, why we even have these stretch codes. So I'm gonna give you um, kind of like the legislation, legislative uh, perspective from, from the state level, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how building codes are adopted and formed, which is so fun. Um, and we're going to talk about the basics of the stretch code as it applies uh, to Maynard specifically. Um, and then I'm going to give you some application and opportunities, and I'll mention a couple of you know things that are kind of more hot topics in our community. Um, I didn't say this before, but I'm also a resident of Maynard, which is why I'm here today, and I offered to give this presentation. And I just want to thank. Um, Megan Samuto and uh, the town of Maynard and everyone here for being here. So thank you all so much for having me. Uh, this, so we're going to start with um, kind of like what is the what is the state level kind of drivers for why we have an energy code update to begin with. Um, you may know, you may not know, but in uh, 2021, uh, Governor Baker signed a climate bill, and there was a lot of pieces to that legislation. One of the pieces of that legislation included uh, committing Massachusetts at a legislative level to greenhouse gas emission reduction. Um, we are are committing ourselves to being fossil fuel free at the state level, and there's a tremendous amount of planning and infrastructure change that needs to occur in order for that to be possible. Uh, the goals are by 2030 to be at a 50% reduction um, of our 1990 levels and by 2040, 75% reduction. And so by 2050, right, we got the math, right? So close to 100%. Um, you know, is that really achievable? Who's to say? Um, it really depends on infrastructure improvements and incentives and how nimble municipalities can be to meet those goals. Um, just, just for reference, right, so we're not assuming anything, what emits greenhouse gases? The top three uh, producers of greenhouse gases in the state are transportation being number one, so cars, heavy duty vehicles, buses, public transit. Uh, we already know there's a big push for electric vehicles. I'm sure you've all heard that. Um, buildings are number two, um, that includes commercial buildings, that includes homes and that includes municipal stock. Um, and then number three is energy production and that number continues to decrease. So we still have even um, in our electricity, uh, greenhouse gas is emitted in the production of electricity that is gonna continue to decrease over time. And so the state's putting a lot of uh, support behind making that transition happen. Why would a, I love asking this question, why would a Republican governor um, commit to to such like 
to that kind of level of um, commitment for a state? Well, uh, there is, I think it's important to understand like where in the conversation we are about climate change. Um, and I think there's still some resonant feelings on or beliefs around like, is climate change happening? Is it not happening? Who caused it? Um, that's really not where the conversation is at the state um, or municipal level anymore. Uh, the conversation is really around this is happening. How do we adapt our resources and our infrastructure to meet, to match and meet the needs of the future? Um, this climate change assessment gets updated every few years. It's put out by I think the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs, I could be wrong on that, um, but it's a state level uh, office that does a climate change assessment every few years. And what they look at is climate stressors and climate hazards. So a climate stressor is temperature, it's participation, precipitation, it's sea level rise. Um, and they look at climate hazards associated with those stressors. So extreme heat, flooding and droughts. Um, and then they, it, I. I'm so impressed with the way this plan was put together because it really gets into the tactile, like, so what does that mean for each town? Um, and they they look at impacts to population. So how does this affect residents? How does it affect our day-to-day -day lives? Um, they look at infrastructure. How is this going to change our infrastructure and affect and stress our infrastructure over, um, over the decades to come? How does it affect the natural environment, right? Our trees, our bees, our... Um, you know, conservation of natural resources. How does it affect governance? And I think this is a really important thing to understand at a, a community and municipal level is that there are impacts to governance that need to be considered when we're looking at, you know, the different stressors that climate change is going to have um, on the way in which we we manage and, and run our, our communities. Um, and then how does it affect the, the economy? Um, and so this plan, uh, which is really like 180 pages, I think, um, gets into the nitty gritty of all of that stuff and also provides some guidance for different communities because what the impacts of a community, the impacts to a community like Maynard are very different from the impacts to a community like a Stowe, mm -hmm. um, which has more natural environment, which has less like concentrated development. Um, and so all those things need to be factored in. The reality is that um, they do all this because they have a state hazard mitigation plan and that hazard mitigation plan is looking at um, our vulnerabilities and identifying projects for development based on uh, the information that they're getting from the climate uh, assessment. So what is the, <laughs> what are we looking at here? I always take a deep breath before I say this because it's hard, you know, as a parent with kids um, to look at the realities of our climate modeling at this point um, by the year 2030, Massachusetts will um, is is predicted, and we're already seeing that. I mean, it's February 15th, and it's 55 degrees outside. Um, Massachusetts will have a climate more uh, comparable to New York State um, by the year 2030. By 2050, it's more like Maryland. Um, at that point, I hate saying this, but um, at that point. You're, we're probably worried, less worried about winter and more worried about uh, intense heat in the summer. By 2070, it's looking more like North Carolina. And by 2090, um, which most of us will not be around for, um, it's looking more like Georgia. And so just the, the reality of that I think can feel um, like a lot of weight. Um, but if we take a deep breath and look at, okay, like what technically is affected by an increase in, in that, or a change in the environmental and the climate. Um, we're really looking at energy use intensity changing from something that is, is primarily driven by heat or heating a building in the winter to um, HVAC in the summer. And I say HVAC because it's not just air conditioning, it's also um, air exchange. There are impacts to, um, you know, allergens and and um, air quality that are also going to come with that. Um, and so, really, like as we are munici a municipal municipality, and we are, um, you know, staff and committee members, we do our planning in on a decade basis, not on an annual basis. So, as we're planning out building stock over the course of the next 50 to 75 years, we really have to consider okay, where are the ways in which this information impacts how we plan and design our buildings, which is why I'm here. 
Okay, so why is Department of Energy and Resources doing this update? Um, really, it's in part to meet the greenhouse gas reduction goals for the state. Um, and they're doing that through through a variety of what I, what I like to say, um, or what we say in our house, which is carrots and sticks. Um, so they're looking at developing all electric incentives for cars, electric vehicle charging, electric vehicle infrastructure, um, increasing clean energy electricity supply production. So that offshore wind project that is what probably about 10 years out will have a dramatic effect on our electricity rates and our electricity supply in Massachusetts. Um, community solar is getting a huge push and that's a whole different conversation, but something to think about. Um, battery storage is going to be um, another hot topic when it comes to energy and then um, geothermal production, of course, um, solar PV as well. Um, increasing funding mechanisms for energy efficiency and electrification is critical to making this shift happen. And so there, that is why the state is putting, um, you know, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars towards this, these improvements. Um, we need the dollars in order to make the change. It's a massive infrastructure uh, investment um, that is needed to make the conversion. Um, they're also providing a lot of technical assistance programs for municipalities and homeowners and uh, industry. And there's a lot available. Obviously, we know about the Mass State. A lot of people know about the Mass State program. There's a lot more out there. And part of it really is, um, for better or worse, it's about you know identifying the opportunities that are out there and having staff to be able to implement these things as well. Um, what are the carrots? The carrots are things like the Mass Save program, the IRA and IIJ fund, IIJA funding coming from uh, the federal level. A lot of that money gets infil gets uh, filtered through green communities program and state agencies. Um, there's a big push for solarization and geothermal. That's again it's a carrot. They're giving a lot of money towards that. A lot of incentives, 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 um, and a huge push for electrification. Um, the sticks. On the other hand, right, you can take the carrot um, or you can meet the stick. And so this is where the energy codes come in. Um, energy codes or building codes in general um, are will increasingly be more stringent over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, that is including renovations. It's um, also, you know, I think it's worth considering on the horizon um, that there's, there's a lot of talk and potential of eliminating a new gas connections. Um, because in order to phase out that gas infrastructure, um, really limiting, and this is a total new, totally new concept that I'm not going to touch on at all beyond this little slide right here, um, limiting the decommissioning of buildings um, and conversations around embodied carbon. So this is another consideration, like a lot of the building stock that we're building today is stuff that we're going to be working with for a long time. Um, and so, you know, keeping in mind that a lot of our houses are, you know, 100 and, well, mine is 115 years old, right? So we have this longevity to building stock that is a new idea. Um, and then high efficiency standards for the building envelope um, and also just FYI, um, by the year 2035, all vehicles sold in Massachusetts, all new vehicles will be electric. So um, obviously that's a lot of stuff and it's a lot of information um, and, I think at the municipal level, it feels like, okay, well, how does this apply to me? And what do I need to do with this information in order to make good decisions? Um, a lot of this conversation today really is kind of just informing you about like kind of what's happening in the ethos around that stuff. So um, the reality is the design and constructions of buildings is increasingly complex. I'm gonna talk a lot more about that in this presentation. Um, the other reality and something that's really, really important for small communities like Maynard to understand is um, that a lot of designers are not keeping up with current, um, one, current incentives, two, current standards, three, just general awareness of what, what's going on um, in the municipal world. And that puts a lot of pressure on building owners, on municipalities to be that informed body, which is a real challenge, especially when you're talking about a small population town like Maynard. Um, it really requires us to look at our building stock differently, um, to look at asset management differently, um, and to look at vulnerability assessment differently. 
Um, it also means thinking differently about um, maintenance and upkeep because we have this longer view perspective um, than what we've had in the past. Um, and the reality is, and one of the reasons why I was um, so driven to make sure that I, I came today was because really without proactive and structural changes, um, many underfunded communities like ours are um, are going to be hit and affected the most um, because we don't have necessarily the resources and the, and the opportunity to proactively take advantage of a lot of the programming that's out there right now. Um, and so all of that is to say, we have the we have the expertise, we have smart people in this room, we have a lot of information, a lot of informed people, and I think um, we have a lot of opportunity uh, to do this really well. Um, and so that's kind of like the, the context and the background. But before I go on, does anyone have any questions on kind of like the setting the stage for why we're doing building code update? Any comments? Zoom, you can ch chime in as well if you want. I'm doing a lot of math about the climate predictions. Yeah. <laughs> I must have heard that before, but oh my God. Yeah, it's a little tough. I had to take a lot of breaks reading that report, which took a long time. Really um, it's it's tough when you, it's tough when you have kids because right like you see all the challenges that they're going to face yeah. with it um but that's okay because we're here to to make good decisions and um to work with information so um i'm going to give you a general how are energy codes formed and where do they come from and um so in general the there is the International Code Council. They uh, do a very general baseline uh, code for buildings, right? So building and, and construction code. Um, within that, they have the Energy uh, Council, which develops the Energy Conservation Code. So IECC is part of ICC. Nothing that you need to remember or, or keep beyond this moment. We're just understanding that. Um, it is an international council. Our, the state of Massachusetts opts into their codes and then Massachusetts, because these codes are general, right? They can be adopted anywhere in the world. Um, so each each state has, or, or municipality, or, um, you know, a lot of times it can be, um, what's the word? I, I keep forgetting this word, county level decisions can opt into these things and then they can add to their code details that are specific to buildings, building needs for that area. For example, California would add in earthquake protection for their buildings, um, maybe, you know, again, you know, different things and vulnerabilities and assessments for buildings there versus Massachusetts that's looking more at um, energy efficiency and cold weather adaptation. So we take that code in the state of Massachusetts and then we add onto it. Um, it's updated on a three-year cycle, so the reason that you're hearing about it today is because the 2021 codes came out, and then the state went through their analysis and added um, stuff to yeah. building codes in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has uh, 351 communities. Uh, 51 of those are base code, or what I call tier one, just for the sake of, this gets really complicated, obviously. Um, so we're going to call it tier one. Base code is tier one, and there are only 51 communities, those little light colored ones on this slide here. Um, there are 300 green communities, which are tier two or above. Um, and within the code, you can see there's tier one, which is our standard, tier two, which is our stretch code. You're going to hear that word a lot. So stretch code is the one that applies to us because we are a green community. And, and it's a good thing because we've pulled in over a million dollars in grants through the green communities program for being a, a green community. Um, in addition, there is a tier three or an expanded stretch code. That's something that people are talking about because it is something we are going to be uh, potentially, if, if municipalities want it, it's something that we can vote on and add to our bylaws. Um, then there's also tier four, which is fossil fuel free. What's important to understand in this entire slide is that um, rather than looking at it like, uh, you know, different possible levels of constraint. We're looking at it like uh, tier four is probably going to be the standard code by 2030. Tier three is probably going to be the standard code by 2025, 2026. And tier two is where we're at now in 2023. So if we're understanding it differently as a time level, we're saying we're seeing that really the codes are going to tier four. It's not a matter of um, if, but like when, okay? Um, with these updates, there's a lot of paradigm shift occurring, and um, that really hasn't been communicated well. 
you have a lot of people that are very technical giving these presentations that are not providing context. And so my goal in all this is to give you context, um, not the, the nitty gritty. You can read the code, you know, if you feel so inclined, um, but it's complicated. So with the update, uh, DOER is, is really shifting the paradigm in the building process. Uh, energy codes are no longer separate. So up until this update, energy code was uh, was kind of, it was with building codes, but it was not baked into the foundation of a building code. I like to call it like, um, you know, building codes were the ice cream and uh, energy codes were kind of a topping. And um, what DOER did is they went to that, uh, it's not Baskin Robbins, but whatever that ice cream place is where they take the toppings and they mix it in with the ice cream and then it's like peanut butter cup ice cream. So now we have uh, building codes that are that, that new flavor of ice cream. Um, they're moving away from, from the HERS model, uh, which is essentially looking at a building and then saying, all right, let's get efficient, let's get efficient windows, let's get an efficient energy system, let's get um, you know, good insulation, let's you know, add all of these things onto the building design that we made. And they're moving to designing the energy system first and then making decisions about the about the whole system with energy in mind and continuing model throughout the process. Um, passive house is going to be the standard. Um, Massachusetts is really excited about that. Do we, DOER is really excited about that. Not a lot of people know what that is. So I think it's important to understand that there's a lot of training around. It's going to be a big um, a technical shift, I think is what I'm saying. So a lot of learning to be done. And, um, you know, from the from the committee perspective, <clears throat> as we have new building permits come in and as we have um, you know, new applications coming in, um, you might experience this frustration with, you know, solar energy not being productive enough is something that we've heard, or, um, you know, this energy system isn't productive enough. And the challenge with that is really that energy modeling needed to, it was like something that needed to happen first. And so when you try to put it on top of a system that isn't built for efficiency, um, it becomes much more challenging. Passive house methodology takes that away. It, it kind of, it bakes it into the process. So um, what they're also doing is including renovations um, in, in this new code, and that's very intentional because they know that the entire building stock in Massachusetts needs upgrades and improvements, and as much as they can capture buildings in, in the process and bring them into the fold, um, that's why that's included. Really, they're saying, they're, they're really signaling here um, that it's an, there is an all-electric future coming, um, phasing out gas infrastructure is happening. Um, encouraging on-site energy energy generation is going to be a standard. So um, efficiency first is also, I think, something that I already touched on. Uh, and I really like the lesson here is that energy efficiency is not a niche. Um, it, it's how infrastructure is built. It's how infrastructure is designed. It is the driving force behind decisions that are made on um, infrastructure. So I can kind of give you, again, this is more like context and high level. Does anybody have any questions on that? I have one question. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Um, going back to the tier, tier one through four, mm -hmm. you mentioned that by 2030, we'll most likely be in the tier four category. Mm -hmm. does, does that mean that buildings that are currently built, will they not be compliant with the oh, tier sure. four? Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, a lot of people ask that. No, existing buildings are not required to make a conversion by with, you know within the next five years. Um, really, what they're saying is for any new construction. So new construction starting at that point <clears throat> is going to be all electric. So we're kind of in this transition phase. We're in like the messy middle. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Perhaps sure. the major renovations for this thing, you know, like they'll be. Mm -hmm. There's there's really specific criteria for major renovation for yeah. renovations and what they meet, and this is the complexity of this code. Um, they the renovation can be subject to a different code than the whole building, but when you're modeling energy, the whole building kind of is the only way to do that rating, and so it kind of can't they can't be separated in most cases. And so again, this is where 
where really what I'm pointing out is like how complicated this has become. <laughs> um, and that's really the lesson. If we learn nothing else, it's super complicated. Um, and I feel like, you know, I spent a lot of time on this and it's not always, uh, sometimes it can be more complicated than, um, than answer questions. So just in general, uh, I'm going to give you a real brief overview of these things. I want to give you an understanding of time frame. Okay. So in, as of January 1st, all new residential homes are under this phase one update to our energy code. That's now. Uh, as of J July 1st of this year, we are in phase one of all commercial code. And I'll talk more about what that means. It's a phased approach, which means for the next year and a half, all residential buildings will have one set of code and starting July 1st, 2024, it will be a an up, there will be an update again. Um, we're kind of prepping the building industry with all this. We're phasing it in. We're giving people time to adapt and adjust. Uh, with the commercial code, it's the same that July 1st, 24 is when um, that new commercial code really comes into effect. So what are the residential code updates? Right now, again, I'm, without giving you too much information on any one thing, there's new pathways to model homes. You see the level of complexity. I'm just going to keep saying that over and over again. This is becoming more complicated. Um, and anytime there is complexity or change, you might hear a lot of complaints. So I'm just kind of like prepping you all for whatever comes down the line in your permitting and approval process. Uh, providing more information and training is kind of essential to 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 matching that. Um, there is the HERS pathway. HERS is the home energy rating score. That's what we currently use. That number has decreased already for residential homes. Um, but if you want to, you can learn the passive house uh, pathway. And that is something, again, that Massachusetts is going to continue to uh, bring ease to approval on, if that makes sense. It will be easier to get things approved if you go passive house route. And to some extent, it's going to be increasingly harder to meet it from the HERS model. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK. Uh, for residential homes, there are categories. And this is where um, things get a little interesting. So single family homes less than 4,000 feet square feet have one set of code. Uh, there are more constraints for single family buildings greater than 4,000 square feet. Multifamilies less than 12,000 square feet are under residential code. Multifamilies above 12,000 square feet are commercial. Okay, so now we have to start to distinguish kind of like our um, approval and just awareness. I think what's most important with all of this is that new residential homes constructed will need at least one electric vehicle charging port with this new code update. <clears throat> Um, I'm not going to explain this more than to say, now this is just for low rise single family homes. The average score in Massachusetts for a low rise single family ho home has a HERS score of 51. So in a lot of ways, that is already, this is already being met. Um, but just to give you a sense of the complexity here, as of January 1st, you have one score four. Uh, a mixed fuel or gas connected home, a mixed fuel home with solar connection, <laughs> an all electric home or an all electric home with a solar connection. So now we see again where things really come in and can get a little hairy. Um, this is why energy makes sense to model from the beginning uh, so that you understand kind of like the code requirements that you're going for. Let's go for it. If I'm reading this correctly. Mm -hmm. The mixed fuel has more stringent mm -hmm. criteria in the future than if it would have to be an electric or solar house. Yeah, exactly. And this is, thank you, because this is kind of the point that, that I'm trying to make with all this is to say, it's just easier to do an all electric house. <laughs> so if, if you don't, you know, like if you want to get into like trying to get that gas connected home approved, you're, it's going to be more hoops. Um, if you go all electric, it becomes easier. So that's what I learned from that, then trying to simplify as much as possible. And that's true for commercial buildings as well. It's if you do all electric, easier. 
if you do like the the you know pathways that they recommend easier if you try to use the old model it's just going to be a little bit harder to jump through those hoops so commercial code um again the commercial code just so we're clear commercial buildings under this update include uh, municipal buildings schools multifamily homes that are large uh, office buildings high ventilation like labs and hospitals all commercial buildings are under this this is layers and layers of complexity that I couldn't possibly explain in an hour. Um, you have buildings categorized again in multifamily, in small commercial, in large commercial, and then high ventilation. I'm really only going to talk about the large commercial um, because that feels more relevant and also um, less complicated. So um, the biggest changes we're shifting out of that, like I said, um, building a building based on whatever you want it to be and then try to make the energy make sense into building it with energy in mind from the, the start. Um, also, and this affects planning board probably with your permit site review and permitting, I don't know, um, but you need EV ready parking um, for 20% of all parking spaces for new businesses um, and residential homes um, and for Municipal buildings, including schools, you need 10% of your parking rewired for EV. So I know that that does have an impact on Green Meadow um, and the, the kind of like planning and, and process for that. Um, there are pres prescriptive pathways to meet energy modeling requirements. Uh, every building is treated differently based on use and size. And uh, this is again, where we get into a level of complexity that is um, a bit challenging. I'm going to give you the basics of it, and then you'll get to look at a number, and I don't know that it's going to make mean anything to anybody, but we'll go for it. So thermal energy demand intensity is the modeling tool that is currently used by the building industry. It's available to be used um, in the modeling software that is typically used by the building community. You have a Teddy number for heating and a Teddy number for cooling. Um, the Teddy limits vary based on the building size, type, and use. And here's some numbers. So <laughs> energy use intensity is really what we're looking at. Um, we're looking at the annual energy use divided by building area, which gives you uh, a number or a rate. If we wanted to translate this into information that we kind of more understand today, it would be looking at Teddy or EUI as essentially the miles per gallon for buildings, right? If you have a car that gets 40 miles to the gallon, it is more efficient than a car that gets 15 miles to the gallon, right? So this is essentially giving numbers to how to rate the efficiency of your systems. You have a heating uh, Teddy limit um, and you have a cooling Teddy limit. Those are each modeled separately and the building systems have to meet those parameters. Um, a K through 12 school has different heating and cooling Teddy than a fire or police station or a library or like town hall, um, which has different limits than a multifamily home. And I think that's all I need to say about that. Yeah. So what does any of this mean and how does it apply to major? <laughs> um, so I wanted to give a quick slide on Green Meadow and I'm happy to talk more about it. Uh, I just wanted to throw up some information because I know decisions were made this week um, and this stuff is all new. And I feel like it's kind of like an it, we're in that messy middle phase where we might not probably don't know about it yet, but it will impact building permitting and approval. Um, if we're looking at tier two, four impacts to large commercial, which is, um, which is Green Meadow. Uh, there's different pathways to modeling energy for this building. The Teddy model or passive house model is different from, um, I, I believe there's another pathway as well. To add a layer of complication to this, the updated stretch code that applies to our town because we are a green community mandates full electrification of space heating based on the type of modeling that you use. So I want to put that out there because I do know that like a decision was just made and I want to make sure that you all have the information that you need. Um, and I'll leave that there. 10% of the parking spaces must be wired for EV charging. Uh, renewable energy is opt optional under this code, but I do know that that is 
part of the, the plan. So um, if Maynard were to do the opt-in tier three, which I didn't talk about at all, and I don't know that we have time today to do that, but I'm happy to talk about it in a future presentation. Um, for a tier three stretch code, if we were to do the opt-in code in, in Maynard, the only difference would be a, a requirement for on-site energy generation, and that can be uh, PV or geothermal. Um, and then there's like a standard for it. So um, I don't know what the current numbers are or anything like that, but that's just information to know. Okay. Uh, I think in general, similar to the climate change conversation, there is still this kind of mystique around energy efficient, efficiency being um, expensive and only for you know, people that have the extra cash in their budget. Um, and so I wanna assure you, and I'm gonna present some information that you can look into later if you want, um, but the Department of Energy and Resources really did, I think, uh, and a lot of, not just me, but a lot of the people really digging into this code are, are very impressed with the process that was done um, because it was driven by cost considerations and done in partnership with the building community. Um, if you've been in around the Boston area, you know Consigli Construction, which is spelled wrong, sorry. <laughs> um, Consigli Construction did the cost modeling for building ba buildings based on the updates to the new code. Uh, I can, this is how they went through their analysis approach. I know some people like to say, where did those numbers come from? Um, they identified representative projects for 12 different scenarios. Uh, they modeled the what that building would do under the base code and then they bought, modeled it under mm -hmm. passive house um, and they bracketed um, construction and energy cost into that so, so what are the construction and energy costs for each scenario um, and then they did iterations and stress tests all sorts of fun engineering stuff that most of us don't need to know about um, but they came out with detailed pricing for each building type um, and they did a lot of building use case studies which you can read about on mass.gov and I have a nice little link right here um, that you can look at later. So what does, and I just put this up there because, and the reason is specific, each of these cost models were done for different building types. So this is the building type cost model that was done for a primary school, which is different from a secondary school, which is different from a commercial building, which is different from a town hall or a fire station. So like, again, all the cost modeling was done specific to buildings, I needed to pull up one and this one felt relevant. So uh, the initial cost to build with uh, the proposed stretch code will increase cost by one to 3%. And the reason that this number matters is because if you're doing cost analysis based on the system that you have today, my guess is that the firm has built this building to standards that exist today. And in between today and the time in which the building permit gets pulled for Green Meadow, building code is going to shift. And so it's important to understand that there could be, could be, I don't, we, I, I don't have the information to know for certain, but there could be a one to 3% cost increase based on the numbers that you have today, um, just to meet the, the building code that will be applicable when it gets, when it gets permitted. Uh, the total savings, they again did the cost modeling for all this is one to 2% over 50 years. And that includes the initial increase in cost. So overall, it is a total reduction in um, in building and maintenance. Um, what's important to know, and I, I think maybe the opportunity here really is in that those numbers do not include incentives through Mass Save. They do not include the MSBA uh, incentives. They do not include IRA or IIJA monies. They do not include any of the federal level programming for schools. They do not include any of the money for environmental justice communities of which Maynard is one. There's a lot of money out there. And so if wherever you are in the process, again, just information to know. Um, it also doesn't include on-site savings due to on-site energy production of which Green Meadow has that. So that's important to understand as well. All right, summary. Wrapping it up, trying not to bore you guys too much. Okay, why does energy matter? Or what is this code update really signaling to owners and developers? Um, I think I think I've made this point and I'll, I'll just continue to reiterate that the building design process really is energy first. 
uh, within the building community, energy use and energy goals are decided in the visioning phase of a building. Um, it's the first thing that you talk about. From there, uh, through a process of designing a building as use is decided, as changes get made, as more requests or considerations are done, energy is modeled throughout that process throughout, right? And it's checked and, and balanced. Um, energy modeling drives building design decisions. Um, I like to think of this as there was a time when we used to build buildings in Massachusetts without um, building codes. There's a time when we used to build buildings in Massachusetts without uh, insulation, right? Standards change over time and then they become the norm. And um, this is just kind of like the newest norm that is getting added to, to the process. Another way to say it is, you know, there was a time before, um, you know, before we considered environmental impacts for decisions that were made. There was a time before EPA. And um, so now we're in a new time where energy drives conversations and it drives decisions. And that's really kind of the lesson here, I think, out of all of it. Mm -hmm. um, the design process is exceptionally <laughs> complex, exceptionally complex. Uh, it is. And unfortunately, because of the time that we're in right now, when we are in a transition from designing buildings a certain way um, to designing buildings in a new way, we are in an, a messy middle, uh, which unfortunately puts building owners really, um, it puts the pressure on building owners to be informed to a level that we've never had to be before. Um, what does that look like in terms of what's kind of happening in the ethos? I'm grateful that my job allows me to connect with so many different people and so many different communities who are facing the same challenge, right? Where are we, like, how do we need to maybe adapt our planning process, adapt our community to meet these, like, new, new, this new normal? Um, one, there is a huge push in this region uh, for the opt-in code. It's already been approved in four communities. I don't have the map, but I can tell you, like there's a lot of towns bringing it to South Town meeting in the spring. There's twice as many bringing it to the fall. I assume there'll probably be about 15 that have it approved by June, and there'll be probably closer to 40 to 50 through fall town meeting it is a huge push within the region. It's really happening. And the benefit to it is, you know, like there aren't a lot of differences between the two levels of code. Um, it's also, I think what we're really saying is let's get out of the messy middle and just get into what's coming next. And that's really what the opt-in code does. Uh, it takes out the messy middle um, or shortens it. Uh, net zero planning is happening, not just for future buildings, for existing buildings. And that is because there is trillions of dollars available for this. Um, and that's that's a now thing, that's not a future thing, um, that's not gonna exist to the same level in five years, um, but it is a now opportunity. Uh, all electric and um, efficiency driven modeling is, is the new normal. Um, there's a big conversation that a lot of sustainability are having around just trying to identify all the incentives that are out there. There are so many from so many different places and it's a bit, challenging to keep up with it all. Uh, we constantly have different email stream, streams of like new information that was found out. And there's no, I would say like, again, from a municipal staff perspective, there's no like technical transfer. There's no information getting out to people about it. There's no like person that's giving you a little newsletter on, hey, here are all these incentives. That's not happening, um, which unfortunately puts the onus back on communities to find it and to be knowledgeable about it. Um, the climate action planning is happening throughout the region. It is um, it is the thing of the times. <laughs> planning it here, um, the sustainability committee here in Maynard is um, is is working on that process. Um, another thing that is kind of coming out of the climate action planning process is um, is new staff, including sustainability coordinators and energy managers at the municipal level, and those are two separate jobs. Um, one thing, and I I think I have another like point on this later, but um, a lot of communities are starting permanent building committees to address this, to address the complexity of building a building today. Um, permanent building committees are different from other committees in that there are there is an application process 
Uh, you have to have some level of uh, professional competency or experience in the area of building. And it has to be relevant to like the times in part because there is so much new information coming out and there is no way that you would, that people as volunteers are able to keep up with it on their own. Um, what are the next steps for mayors? Like how, again, how does this apply to us right now? Um, one of the things that we're kind of tossing around, um, and I've mentioned this to Justin, our DPW director, and um, I'm also doing it in the town that I work for, is a municipal building stock energy assessment. So looking at, this is a whole separate conversation, um, but looking at our current building stock and finding opportunities to apply current incentives to um, you know, make meaningful investments in that stock. Uh, looking at our HVAC systems, there's a lot of money right now for HVAC specifically in schools and for environmental justice communities of which we have those, <clears throat> right? Um, a lot of, I think for us like today, one of the things that, that we have, you know, kind of an opportunity or that I can push back on all of you is that um, it's an opportunity for collaboration to kind of talk about uh, energy and, you know, these updates to code and how they, they impact certain, you know, different subsets of, of work in town. Uh, I didn't really touch on this at all, but this code update is absolutely prioritizing affordable housing and um, and people with limited or fixed incomes. It's prioritizing energy efficiency for those units. And so <coughs> I was having a conversation to just understand that, that that really is the goal. And you might hear from developers like that, this is hard for us to meet, but the reason is because the expected cost of energy is continue, going to continue to be a increasing budget item. Um, planning and zoning, I think it's worth, you know, obviously you're here today. I think it's worth having a conversation about that. You know, you can also um, potentially look at energy code and energy modeling um, as it relates to, you know, bylaws for the downtown district. Um, my, my big recommendation here is to consider, um, you know, making steps towards a permanent building committee. Um, it gives you the opportunity to have expert review of existing building stock, um, to look at hard data around energy demand, um, to have some informed, uh, knowledgeable um, people that understand complexity and nuance here. You're going to have, and will continue to have, the experience of having engineers and architects and designers who do not have a good awareness of incentives and, um, and current requirements. Um, and that is just because we're in the messy middle for the next few years. And unfortunately that puts again, the pressure on municipalities to be that expert in the room, which is a challenge again for a small community. Um, but at the end of the day, again, recommendation on the permanent building committee also hedges some of the decision-making and takes it off the plate of uh, a select board or um, a group of people that don't do building development as their day job and gives you know opportunities for informed decision making. So um, I put this up here because you know I talked a bit about the energy assessment of current building stock. I and I it didn't, it didn't click until I, this morning as I was kind of getting this, these slides together. Um, it might be worth considering an energy committee even just to oversee assessment of current energy use and needs. I'm not really gonna touch on this a lot, but I have to, I think it's important to understand that even when you have an electricity contract, which we do, um, that only fixes the cost of supply. It does not fix the cost of delivery. That delivery cost in many cases is more than the fixed cost of supply, which means even if we have um, you know, some fixed costs around energy, there's an unpredictability to the future cost. And that varies, I mean, 40 to 50% just in the handful of like, this last year. Um, and I'm doing this assessment in my town um, or the town that I work for. Um, happy to talk more about that here. There's also a lot of opportunity for energy reduction through behavioral-based programming. Uh, the town of Acton has done a great job with that. We have a roadmap, an example of how we can do that in the schools. 
um, climate action planning, which sustainability committee is working on. Um, I think there's a real opportunity here for impacts to, to looking at how this affects residential, existing residents, residents, um, and existing commercial buildings, um, and opportunities for really identification of resources and, and incentives to support this conversion. Um, not for nothing, but, you know, our more vulnerable population, particularly those on a fixed income, of which we have, you know, a good percentage here in Maynard, um, are going to have to do some investments in order to be able to keep their homes cool in, in hot weather. And so <laughs> have resources available for them to, to support that process is something that a lot of communities are doing right now. Um, and they're outsourcing it, so it's not like a, a staff needs to do this. It's a, it's a service that's paid for with, with reasonably short dollars. Um, climate action plans also open the door to a lot of funding. A lot of times when you're applying for, you know, this mass save, MVP, green communities, um, and MAPC funding and support, one, you need integration with the, municip the municipal government. Um, you need a champion on, on municipal staff. Um, and it needs to fit in, it needs to be shown to fit in with an overarching plan. And so this is where climate action planning gets to be like a real opportunity to have conversations and integrate planning with like with matching needs. Um, and, uh, you know, there are opportunities. A lot of times CAPS can come out with um, opening the door to funding for sustainability coordinators and energy managers, which <coughs> can be funded and paid for and paid for themselves. So summary. Uh, changes and opportunity. <laughs> I wanted to end on a high note. I know it's a lot of information and like we're, it's going to take a while to like disseminate and resonate in. Um, I think I probably raised more questions than answered um, them, but you know, at least now we have information and um, I'm happy to have discussion and I'll, I'll stop the share so that if anybody has questions, um, I'm available. To answer them. Does anybody have anything, any questions? Um, anything we're talking about? Oh, I, um, I, I sure. love to ask the question about, um, I love the idea of the energy committee. I know other towns have it mm -hmm. um, and working with an, a, perhaps a part time paid staff mm -hmm. as an energy manager. Um, that would not just be for municipal energy use, right? That could also be a resource for people retrofitting their own residences. That that might be the missing point where sure. the, the resources available and the funding available to yeah. do retrofits in addition to right. right. Yeah, and, and it is a whole topic in itself. You're so right, Kate, that um, you know, there's a lot of information out there, and it's definitely its own niche and worth its own kind of space in conversation. Um, I think typically energy managers at the municipal level are focused on energy for facilities, specifically these businesses. Um, a lot of times that resourcing that you're talking about for homeowners comes through sustainability coordinator or sustainability committee. Um, but you know, each town gets to make their own choices and, and own models and make, sense, make choices that make sense for them. So yeah, absolutely. Anything else? I do have, I mean, I can answer detailed questions if you all have them about the stretch code. I'm happy to do that. Also, you're welcome to unmute. Zana's asking or has her hand raised. Oh, no, that's just my, that's oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, though. That was good. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Please, thank you. I'm thinking about the opportunities that we, in alliance with Acton, mm -hmm. um, developed the powder mill corridor. Mm -hmm. And you know, I know in Framingham they're doing community geothermal to kind of raise the, you know, mm -hmm. efficiency of an entire community. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems like the sort of thing that would happen. That that kind of thinking an energy committee could help with. Right. But also, it's the sort of thing that happens before. We plan out the whole community and then retrofit it in. I mean, again, that's such an opportunity. Yeah, I agree with you, Kate. I was thinking again; it just didn't occur to me until this morning. And I was thinking about how much energy, like an energy study, energy analysis, energy, you know, like bigger level planning, does affect climate action planning, and it does they feed into each other um, for sure. And so, 
you know, opportunities for overlap and opportunities for, you know, more detailed analysis on that, I think is really important. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and it's also, you know, looking at energy production at a municipal level and looking at you know, wh what is our current production, what are the agreements that we have with that, what do we own, what's the timeline, um, and then also, you know, what opportunities are out there to, to improve and to build upon. Um, you know, like I said, community solar is, is like becoming a big thing, and I that requires uh, land that... <laughs> open available land, um, which doesn't really fit the Massachusetts model, but, you know, we have that on the old landfill. And I think, um, you know, those are, those are things that a lot of people are thinking about, you know, what are the ways in which we can look at more community scale energy production? Um, the geothermal, community geothermal is being piloted as a way to build off of existing gas infrastructure and replace, repurpose it. Um, so that's why I say, you know, gas is new gas connections are, you know, likely going away, but there might be opportunities, particularly for more densely populated communities like Maynard to convert. Um, but that's, you know, probably 15, 20 years away um, from being applicable. Are gas companies getting into the geothermal game because they realize that, that they're kind of on their way out? Um, I think my understanding is Eversource bought National Grid, mm -hmm. so they're now one utility. So they benefit from that makes sense. They benefit from it. Um, another thing, thank you for asking that, Megan. Um, because another thing to to just be aware of, kind of like market shifts, <laughs> um, as this push for electrification continues. Um, the number of people relying on gas are going to decrease and the cost to operate the gas system will continue to rise. There is an expectation that gas prices will outpace electricity prices within the next five to eight years. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. A lot of times when we're doing pricing, we're basing it on current rates. And that, I mean, again, with more detailed energy analysis, you can kind of dig into it a bit. But the reality is like, um, at the end of the day, I look at the numbers and I say on-site energy production, just stop having to rely on the unpredictability of what rates are going to be in the future because there is no certainty. The only certainty is if you are, you know, a net zero building, now you know what your energy cost is. Um, and if you're not, <clears throat> and if this is really kind of like the next 10 years spectrum, because I, 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 I think there is a lot enough work being done that electricity rates are known about and will continue to, like they're working there's systems being come online and um, more energy producers that are clean energy producers that will come online in the next 10 to 15 years but there's like this messy middle thing that i'm that we're kind of in right now and that's why on-site production becomes really important because we have to buffer buffer mm -hmm. increasing costs um and it's not <coughs> true in every community you know um Stowe has very low electricity rates because they are on the Hudson Light and Power Plant, um, I believe. And so they don't have incentives to go on to solar. They don't have incentives to do geothermal. And um, there's a different thing, right? Like, and so they're wanting like money to be able to do the conversion and simultaneously just don't have the incentive to do it where a town like Maynard with what we pay, um, absolutely it is, is more, far more possible um, and possibly necessary because we're subject to this market rate change, which is so variable. But, Julie, you mentioned something, mm -hmm. I, if I understood it correctly, in that the promotion of some of these incentives mm -hmm. has not been as robust as it may be. It, yeah. Uh, is that what is that what I caught earlier? That you oh yeah, no, nobody knows about. I mean, like within so within sustainability coordinators in this whole region, um, we meet monthly, and a lot of times we're like, "Hey, did you know about X, Y, Z?" And there's literally no dissemination of information. It's really it's really tough, and it, unfortunately, it means that communities that have sustainability coordinators get the money, and communities that don't don't. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's a really challenging reality. There's another layer to this, though, that I think is really important to understand. Um, one, my desk as sustainability coordinator in an affluent town that is very well funded um, has pulled in about four hundred thousand dollars a year in incentives and and um, benefits and grants um, for the town of Natick, which has more of a 
I think it's it's either Natick or Newton, um, that has an environmental justice population. It's millions, millions of dollars. And so this is the point where I know sometimes we make decisions here that are kind of penny wise and pound four. Okay. Um, and I think it's important to have more analysis before you know we really head down this road. But there is absolutely the case to be made for a community like Maynard that fits our population and our um, income levels um, and that environmental justice de designation for the possibility of, I mean, big, big money, not not like $400,000, which is a lot, um, but millions. And so that's something that I think it needs attention and you know obviously you know we're already i feel like resource drained here um but but having decision makers aware of that and know that it's a now thing it's not going to be here in five years um it's it very much is in this moment um is important to know well because so. we were just designated as environmental justice yeah parts of this and and it seems to me that it would be incumbent upon anybody who wants to take the initiatives mm -hmm. forward in the community to make it as available as we can to potential develop developers mm -hmm. and why it is in their fiscal mm -hmm. interest to pursue these mm -hmm. avenues. It seems that I'm glad that you mentioned that and maybe it's something we can work towards because yeah. it's one thing to do, to codify something or just say, okay, you're gonna do this. And, right. and if you're not marketing the whole package at it, it right. would be much, you know, make it a, like a carrot rather than a stick. Exactly. Yeah, you're so right. I mean, there's a lot of ways that we can make it um, work, work it. I mean, work it because it's there, right? So there's not an educational program for developers and construction people? Not, not really. Yes. I mean, they're working on it. I, I've heard that there's, there's training available. I just, I want to point out like the reason that I gave this presentation here yeah. is in part because the context is really missed. Mm -hmm. um, the information that's getting put out now, one, contradicts itself, which is really challenging, and two, is so highly technical. Again, it's like, um, you know, looking at the, the fibers of a leaf without seeing there's a whole tree there, right? Like, we're just missing the point. Um, and this is the kind of information that we need at the municipal level to make good decisions um, and have, you know, informed conversations around it. So it's so hard because so much of our job here is reviewing plans that mm -hmm. someone else was supposed to do. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times they ask us to help them design them. Yeah. Which we can't do because it's not our job and we don't have the capacity to be our <coughs> consultant. Yeah. Um, and so this sounds like it's going to further complicate things so much to have to explain it all again. Yeah, it's like, oh, you don't like this. Well, how would you do it? It's like, well, you have to figure that out, you right? Know? Like, and that's not, it's not proactive, but like, that's not our role, you right? Know? And there's also, yeah, there's um, liability associated with providing too much information. Yeah. I think, I think there is, you know, again, um, what, whether it's a permanent building committee or um, an energy committee, whatever, whatever kind of comes next. Um, to start to build resources around uh, proactive education yeah. and outreach or with building um, with developers that that typically draw permits in town. I think that's a worthy. I mean, that should be effort. done by the state. Yeah, it, and it it will be. Yeah. I think the difference is, and this is again, it's the same thing with grants and funding that can exist. And if nobody knows I about know. it here, we still bear the brunt of having to deal with. <laughs> developers that don't understand right. that it's not Maynard that made these changes it's a state level yeah. thing and here's your state level programming so proactive um I think outreach and education is going to be like the thing of the times for the mm -hmm. next like I said five to ten years um because we're in this like messy middle period um yeah gotcha um this may be a question for Megan and Bill but what's the mechanism for um for opt for for the town to adopt the opt-in stretch codes that you mentioned? I think the process would likely be, um, if, you know, like any, it has to go through town meeting. So someone would recommend it for the town meeting warrant. And I think it likely would be the sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be the, the most typical path. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's a bylaw, um, and DOER recommends at least six to 12 months between the time that it is voted in and the time that it gets implemented. So if it went to Springtown meeting, the earliest it would be um, kind of on the bylaws would be January 1st. If it goes to fall town meeting, it would be July 1st. And there's a process to, right, we have to put the warrant on, we have to put it on the warrant, <coughs> something like that. So. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that the uh, sustainability committee wanted to take a beat over that mm -hmm. was because we don't have a climate action plan, mm -hmm. but the town has given its input in the municipality and the public yet. Mm -hmm. We wanted to, you know, be working on that before Sure. Suggested. Yeah, I I was surprised to learn that um, Lexington, who's I think going for that level, that tier four code, um, doesn't have a climate action plan. I, I assume because like it's so it's such a big piece of their identity um, to be climate leaders, and I think sometimes you know again. Um, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. Climate climate action plan is a piece of this. Energy management is a piece of this. It's kind of like putting all those puzzle pieces in the right place together, and also making sure that committees are communicating with each other and on the same page with with whatever changes are coming down the line. Um, I think that's really the critical piece of all this is that what this energy code technically falls under sustainability and yet affects. Right, like so much of municipal government and the way in which we choose and, and operate. So, um, and I, I can tell you, like, if I was on uh, the affordable housing group the commission and had to deal with a bunch of frustrated developers about energy stuff, I would want to proactively know about why they're getting frustrated um, and and like what, what we can do about it. So, anytime I think, you know, again, this is an opportunity to buffer out resources. And um, and have conversations. I, I would say this is the first of many conversations about energy and and what we want to do to kind of like you know bolster up our resources. So, um, anything from Zoom? Anybody have anything to say or add or question? No. Thank you. Uh, all. Said, uh, it's it, this is Priscilla. If you can, it, are you will you be able to share um, these slides with us? Yeah, yeah, I can send That's, it. Yeah. Um, Sure. I'll, I can send it to Kate, who can distribute them, and yeah. then this has been recorded, so we can get it up online. Yeah, that'll um, be great. It's it's this was excellent. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Anything else? Good. Thank do, you. Do so I have much. to like officially close this or anything? No, thanks, all right. Um, I mean, thank you all for joining us online. Um, I hope you were able to stay awake through the whole thing, and I hope you have a great week. All right. Thank you.